Good afternoon, friends. Thank you so much for joining us for our first installment of Golondrinas Live Sessions. My name is Laura Gonzalez. I'm the Education and Volunteer Manager here at El Rancho de las Golondrinas, Living History Museum located out, outside of beautiful Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, we do apologize for the delay in coming live. We had a bit of a storm cell passing over. We wanted to kind of outweigh the, the wind there, but as New Mexicans, we're always so grateful for the moisture. So, and as they say, good things come to those who wait. So I am joined here today by two of our blacksmiths, Taylor Vallow over here of Santa Fe School of Blacksmithing and Bill Vandevaldi of Leonard's Ornamental Iron. So Bill and Taylor both come out regularly during museum special events and field trip days for the, for the school kids when we're open and they do blacksmithing demonstrations out of the shop. So perhaps you've seen them. <clears throat> Uh, we'll also be taking some questions, so feel free if you have any questions throughout the segment. Um, we'll be taking questions throughout and at the end, so make sure to put any questions or comments into the, uh, the body of the email there. So before we get started here, I wanted to share a little bit about the history of blacksmithing here in New Mexico and why this was so important and why this is a demonstration that we like to showcase here. In fact, this is one of our most, um, our most popular demonstrations here at Las Colondrinas, and it's because in New Mexico's past, being a blacksmith was a really, uh, a really great thing to be. It was a really respectable job, a really respectable trade and skill to have because it was really necessary. For a long, long time in New Mexico, there was not a lot of metal to speak of. In some places, there weren't any tools and things were made primarily of wood. And when there was metal, it was far and few between. So things had to be repaired or new things had to be made, uh, forged. And so that's where the blacksmith came in. So. Bill, Taylor, thank you so much for joining me here today. Thank you so much for coming out to do this demonstration for us. Thank you for having us. Thank you, pleasure to be here. So let's get started by sharing with our Facebook friends what your little setup here is. Okay, uh, this is your anvil, this is what you pound your iron on, your anvil stone. It also holds a lot of the tools that you use constantly. Uh, you gotta have your quenching bucket and your forge. So you have your hammers and tongs and other tools that you need for doing whatever you're working on. All right. And I guess you have the two main important tools, the hammer and anvil. So. Hammer and anvil, two most important tools of the blacksmith. Now, how much does an anvil like this weigh? Is this pretty standard size? That one weighs 110 pounds. 110 pounds, wow. And uh, what's your source of fuel here that you got this fire going? The source of fuel is coal. Excellent. Yes. Traditionally, you would have been using uh, charcoal, but if you could get your hands on some coal, a nice bituminous coking grade coal is primarily what we burn. So the way it, I guess, kind of keeps the shape of a, of a campfire more so instead of just ashing down like anthracite. Wonderful. So you guys, as I mentioned to our friends, you guys are active blacksmiths within the community of Santa Fe. And so you guys always have several projects going. What projects are you working on here today that you're sharing with us? Uh, today I'm going to be demonstrating how to make nails. And Taylor will be demonstrating how to do forge welding. Excellent. Whenever I get the reins, I'll play some, with some forge welding. So nails. Nails is... So nails is something that if, if some of you have visited during our, our school field trip days, Taylor here is usually in his shop and one of the things that he likes to give to kids are little bits of nails, right? That's kind of one of the most popular things. Now, um, in history, as a blacksmith, how many years would it have taken to work up to be a master blacksmith? You would have had to have been a, an apprentice first, right? I guess depending on the aptitude, but you know, what? Maybe uh, starting when you're 10, 12 years old, going anywhere from seven to maybe longer. But as soon as you get, you know, it's like as soon as you learn what you can from one shop, you get a letter of recommendation and go on down the road and start your journeymanship. Excellent. Now, is this something that would have been passed down generations within families, mostly? Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. Uh, sometimes you just have a knack for it and you pick it up and it's just a love of working with it. And other times it was trained in your family. 
to where you were expected to become a blacksmith. Well, who else had to would pump the billows, right? Yeah, <laughs> <Child> labor, <laughs> free labor. <laughs> Pump the bellows. Now, the bellows is something that people, I think, most associate with blacksmithing. Now, you don't have bellows right here. If you've if you visited our shop, you've probably seen the bellows. But what are you using to create that draft today? This is a Champion Forge, and it's got a crank blower on it. Uh, this dates back to the late 1800s. All right, let's give a little a little show to our friends on Facebook here. thing you do is you draw out your material to the length of the nail that you're to the desire of the length of your nail you got to constantly crank on your blower and tend your fire because you don't want the fire to get too big or it's burning more than than what you need all you need is to keep that into a small little pod there and that's where your main source of heat is the center of that fire can get up to about 25, 2800 degrees. A good working temperature on your middle is around 1600 degrees. And there's, you can't just stick a thermometer down in there to see how hot it is. So it's all by sight. It's part of learning to be a blacksmith is you learn your heat by the color of your material. And I can feel that fire. That is a, definitely a, a a very hot source of heat there. So you say it's just by sight, and is it something like the, the condition of the metal or the color that changes? 1600 there. Then you want to bring down the rest of the nail to a consistent size. Try to keep it as straight as possible. Now, is the metal you're working with iron, and was that would, have, would that have been the primary metal that they would have worked with? Then they had iron. Now we have steel. Steel is a high carbon iron. This that I'm using today is uh, actually, if you want to be technical, it's an A36 mild steel. And I started out with a 5 16 round bar to make this size of nail. Uh, depending on what size of nail and spike that you're using is what type of material you want to start with. And so we had a question come through. Um, where would people in New Mexico have gotten their iron or their metal back in the old days? Uh, it came from Spain. All your iron and everything came from Spain because you had to pay taxes on it. So if you were caught smeltering your own iron, you could be hung, you could be shot, you could be quartered. It was not good to smelter your own metal. Wow. Now, is this something they would have purchased? You said they had to pay taxes on it. So they'd have to place an order and then pay for it, had to make it completely official. That's why blacksmiths were the original recyclers because you used everything down to the last thing was making a nail. So what would have been, say you're a blacksmith in 1800 New Mexico, what would have been probably, what would have kept you the busiest in your shops? What would people have needed the most? Tools for your ranches and gardening and farmers. Uh, carpenters needed tools, so you made all their axes and chisels, stuff like that for them. But your main thing was just utilitary items. People, stuff that people needed for everyday use. So that's what it is. Usually today on TV and TV shows, they kind of romanticize the blacksmith a lot. He's always making swords and chain mail. And while that certainly was something they would have done, especially here in New Mexico, it would have been more common that people needed nails or horseshoes or something breaks. And then you mentioned being the first recyclers, they would have been responsible to, to reforge it into something new, correct? Yes. 
So it sounds like blacksmiths would have made a pretty good living, being that this trade was so important and people were really in need. <laughs> Maybe not so much. Um, how would people pay for your services back in the day? Anything from trading, I guess anything from trade to buy, I guess to bartering. You know, more often than not, kind of like uh, what Bill and I were talking about uh, a little while ago about uh, uh, flux that we would use as borax. So they had mines, but the so the blacksmith would have been able to trade a bucket of nails or something for some borax, so it made a good trade item. So, wow. so something that would have been useful to you as well, mm -hmm. well in, in, your, in your line of work. Oh, just as long as somebody's giving me some, you know, honey and vegetables, you know, <laughs> make it worth it so you can keep on pounding away. There you go. So Bill, what happens in the process if you're hammering away and you hit a little too hard and you break the metal all together, then what do you do? Start over. <laughs> Back into the fire. That's that's all you can do is just start over. If you burn a piece of metal, if you get it too hot and it starts sparking on you, if you're not forge welding, it makes the metal real brittle. And you just have to kind of scrap that piece. That's That's all you can do. It all goes from one scrap pile to the next. You have your large scrap pile all the way down to your small pieces. and <laughs> like, like you said, making nails would be the last thing they would be used for. If you could smelt her down your own metal, then you, all your little pieces that were left, you'd melt that down into an, and make an ingot and then start shaping that into something new. So it sounds like nothing goes to waste. Absolutely. <laughs> so something that people I think notice a lot when they're watching blacksmith demonstrations or maybe forged in fire the television show they see that once you've made your tool you dunk it into usually a bucket of water can you explain that process a little bit uh, go ahead well depending on I guess uh what steel you're using would dictate what you quench it in, if you quench it at all. Uh, like you talked about Fortune Fire, that you know, pop popular TV show, they're quenching their blades in oil. That's because they're using normally using a higher carbon uh, tool steel. We're working with a low carbon, mild steel, as you said, A36 structural. So we can quench that in water and it won't, uh, won't uh, well, be as abrasive to it whenever it quenches because whenever metal heats and cools, it expands and contracts. So depending on, like if you're making a knife, you're quenching it at a certain temperature where the grain is perfectly in line for what you want. So one thing you probably all notice is that these two gentlemen aren't wearing any gloves. Um, so my question is, do you guys ever get injured or burned or smash your fingers or anything like that while you're blacksmithing? Not on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> and if so, you're a quick learner not to pick up the hot iron. Assume everything is dangerous. So. Good to know. How long have each of you been practicing the art of blacksmithing? Well, I guess uh, blacksmithing, I started in 2011 uh, at Frank Turley's uh, Turley Forge, a uh, uh, school of blacksmithing. He's retired now, but I spent about eight years with him, lucky enough to just uh, tail along and just learn some stuff. But my my attention span, it was the longest, It's uh, it's the, it was the one thing that's really kept my attention through the years, so I'm definitely found something I'm in love with. And Bill, uh, 
Uh, I started out as child labor in my dad's welding shop. <laughs> so I've been doing this most of my life. Oh, professional blacksmithing since I was in my early 20s. So that gives me about oh, close to 40 years that I've been doing this. And Bill here has been with El Rancho de las Colondrinas since probably, what, Bill, the 80s? Late 80s or so. We, we opened as a museum in 1972. Bill has been here since about the 80s. He actually was also uh, part of the crew that helped to reconstruct our big mill if you've ever visited the site. So Bill and Las Colondrinas go way back. Taylor as well has been here for several years. And as I said, if, if any of you have had the, the wonderful opportunity when we're open to come to some of our special events, um, this is a demonstration that's not to be missed. Um, usually they are in their shops. Um, but for technical reasons, of course, we had to do it in a different space today. So what else, gentlemen? What else can we teach people here about blacksmithing? All right, so I believe he's going to finish up his nail, and then I'll go okay. ahead and do some forge welding. Now, if uh, any of you for, from, are familiar with metalworking, uh, you might have heard of welding. Welding is joining two separate pieces. Uh, together to form a cohesive bond. Now back in the day, blacksmiths couldn't well, pull out their oxyacetylene or a MIG welder. They had to forge weld. So that's how Bill was talking about using our temperatures, using our temperatures and getting it to a certain, certain temperature. And it's really, really hot. It's done on the rising heat, brought to your uh, incipient, uh, bringing it into an incipient burning range to where the, your two pieces can come together. Well, and I guess I'm about to get into it. It's easier to show than talk about sometimes. <laughs> Thank you, sir. It's all yours, my friend. Thank you, sir. You want to pump a So now, Bill, this is the hand crank that you were talking about. So you all see that the fire is going up. Um, in, a, in a setup like this, this takes the place of the more permanent setup where they would have the big bellows providing oxygen to the fire. So Bill right back here, if you can see, is hand cranking it, which opens the little, the little shaft to allow the air to flow into the fire. That's good. All right, so how Bill was talking about, you know, being the ultimate recycler, we would use everything. Um, you could, like, say uh, a farrier, if he's making his horseshoes, he'll take two worn-out horseshoes, loop them over, forge weld one and a half of old horseshoe together, and that will give it an, should give it about enough material to make one brand new horseshoe. So that would be using a forge weld, so uh, kind of a lap weld in there. So I wanted to show you. Here comes the rain. That'll really be good for a, for a forge weld. Um, so whenever I'm getting ready to weld something, uh, like I'm going to go ahead and weld a loop on here. You have to prepare the end of your uh, piece of material to forge weld back into itself. So it kind of just fits perfectly. For a more complicated forge weld, like a pair of tongs, like this, welding two separate pieces together, uh, a lot can go wrong. <laughs> right in the middle. And Taylor, here on display, are these some of the tools that you've already made? Oh yeah, so this is a, an unfinished pair of tongs right here. Uh, it's got two forge welds, one right here, one right here. So the last thing to do would just be cut it in half and assemble them. And or I could just keep adding it to my accordion of, uh, well, <laughs> of curiosity, right? <laughs> 
So I guess depending on what you're doing, like I said, right now I'm going ahead and making a simple scarf. If I'm welding round to round, it's a lot easier to fade a, fade a point into round stock. So, what was I saying? <laughs> Where were we at? Uh, fading the round. There's a lot of technical terms with blacksmithing. It's, it is definitely a science as well as an art. Well, we're, it's like, I guess we're not a bunch of knuckle draggers like most people might think. There's a, a lot more thinking involved. Uh, heck, after school I never thought I'd use pie. I mean, it's like now I'm using pie all the time. You know, and the cool thing about it, it's 22 over 7. Didn't make sense until I put in fraction form. Ah. All right, folks. So are there any questions or comments coming through that anything anybody's curious about? Make sure if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and type them into the into the field there, and we'll get those answered for you. All right. So right now, I'm just going to grab some more coal over here. So you mentioned in the past that people would have had to pay taxes and actually purchase their coal from Spain. Um, where's the best place to get it today? Is this something that's a little bit easier to obtain? <laughs> well, uh, over the last few years, I guess it's gotten a little bit harder to get your hands on, uh, depending on the regulations and some of the mines shutting down around here, right? Yes. Like, but uh, as far as like traditionally, well, they had a mine out in Cerrillos area. Yeah, so I think it was one of those few mines that actually had anthracite and bituminous. So is this something that's a little harder to come by? Because Bill, I know that in previous conversations with me, you say that it's gotta be a, a real clean source of fuel. You can't just go bag a, go get a bag of charcoal, right? It's gotta be- No, it doesn't work. You need coking coal, which is a bituminous coal, and it comes in different grades. So you need a good coking coal for working a forge. Uh, your harder coals are good for heating, like your home and then your stove and this and that, but it's, you gotta have a special kind of coal just for forging. And it's getting really hard to come across. Oh, man. We, we may have to wind up going to Pennsylvania for it. And there's no other option? There's no other source for it? No uh, replacement for it? Uh, not really. You can use charcoal, but not like what you cook with. Uh, you have to make your own charcoal out of wood. Burn the wood and then collect the charcoal from it. That's a, one other source of it. Uh, the only other thing is go to using gas forge. But you don't have as much control over your heat in a gas forge as you do. Just put it on the ground. Yeah, I think people want to see you dunk something in that bucket of water. So true to, to Las Golondrinas and to New Mexico in general, we do things the old-fashioned way around here, right, Bill? Yes. Coal, There's no shortcut. Coal is the best source of heat for doing what we do. Makes perfect sense. All right. Uh, now I'll talk about why. <laughs> it's like some, one of the... Anything can go wrong with forge welding. Like right now, we just pulled out some clinker and could be the weather, so... <laughs> Sometimes you just have to commune with with the iron. Yes, please. So that's a good question. What's the biggest problem as a blacksmith that you guys encounter? People. <laughs> People, no. It's uh, kind of a solo job. Well, uh, I guess one of the hardest parts about it is what I enjoy most about it, the problem-solving aspect of it. Somebody, you know, somebody walking into your shop saying, Oh, can I get one of these, or can you fabricate this? Might be kind of a headache, but you know, I always like the challenge of, okay, how can I replicate what the blacksmiths of old would have done? Let me be a problem solver. So you have to study what they did and R and D it till you can figure out every move that they made to actually refabricate something of old time. I've done a lot of work for the. Mexico History Museum uh, duplicating some of their antiques 
and I make mine to look new, and they that way they can show behind their glass. This is what it looks like 300 years ago. It was buried in dirt. This is what it looks like now. But I'll make them a new one, showing that this is what it would have looked like brand new. Wow. Well, it looks like we're getting some sprinkles out here at Las Colondrinas. So if there's uh, any more questions or comments that you folks think of, please make sure to put those in the comments, and we'll make sure to uh, get back to you on that. Um, again, thank you all so much for joining us. If any of you want to get in touch, as I mentioned in the beginning of this segment, both Taylor and Bill are active working blacksmiths within the Santa Fe community. So if you're interested in learning more about the trade, if you're interested in getting involved in blacksmithing, anything at all, if you have any follow-up questions, make sure to put them in the comments, get in touch with us, and we'll get you in touch with Bill and Taylor. Um, also, uh, if you guys enjoyed this live demonstration, um, there's a donation button um, somewhere in the top of your feed comments. Um, for those of you that, that may not know, Las Colondrinas is a nonprofit organization, so we are really grateful for the support of our community. We rely on memberships and donations and, of course, admissions. And as we remain closed, we're trying to create as much programming for you online as possible. And again, we really appreciate you spending a little bit of time on your Friday afternoon with us for this live blacksmith demonstration. Demonstration. Um, please be sure to join us again for our next Golandrinas live sessions. Keep up with us right here on Facebook. We also have an Instagram page, SF Golandrinas, and a website where you can also make a donation. You can check out some of our resources that we have on there. Keep up to date with what we're doing. Sign up for our newsletter. Um, so is there anything else you'd like to say, gentlemen? So you might want to step back. Oh, got to step back here. I guess the forge well, though it didn't want to burn you. So. I didn't want to get burned either, so thank you, Taylor. So I think we had a question come through. If we can get that repeated to me, please. Oh, very good question. So we have a question coming in. Were blacksmiths pretty rare in New Mexico? Yes. yes. Uh, very few and far between because New Mexico was so scattered out back then. And to, even for a small village like this, to have had a blacksmith, you have been very, very well looked up to because people have been coming from all around this area just to see the blacksmith. I'm sure Santa Fe had a blacksmith, but for like the little areas out here, you weren't, there weren't that a lot of blacksmiths around here. Back east, yes. So people, if you're living in some of those outlying villages and you needed the, the skills of a blacksmith, you had to travel to a, a more established community to seek their services. And so it would have been a really highly respectable trade in New Mexico because they were so rare. Excellent. I think, are they still rare today? You two are the only two I know. <laughs> well, we're starting to gain some popularity, you know. <clears throat> like uh, down where... Uh, on industrial, uh, where our school is at the moment, we've got plenty of blacksmiths around us. It's one of those places where, wait, I didn't know blacksmiths were over here. Yeah, they set us over there to where it's like they didn't want to bother anybody else with the coal. So, well, maybe after this presentation, you'll get a few people that are interested in in learning more about blacksmithing. Um, so once again, folks, thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with us on your Friday afternoon. We'll be uh, doing more Golandrinas live sessions in the coming weeks, so make sure to check with us on our Facebook, our Instagram. And um, again, we hope you have a safe and happy weekend. And remember, your adventure starts at golandrinas.org.